tonight, at any rate, we've got to go through some theoretical material, so we're on a head trip. I don't know where the trip will end up. It depends on you. But in order to lay the foundation for this, we've got to examine ideas that are basic to our common sense. Ideas are very powerful. It's not only emotions that are powerful in human life. Psychoanalysis has, of course, examined the emotional bases of human opinions and beliefs. But one should also examine the intellectual bases of psychological principles, or theories, or therapies. Because everybody who speaks a language at all has underneath the surface of the language or the figuring that he uses certain basic assumptions which are usually unexamined. And these unexamined systems of belief are extremely powerful in their influence over our lives. We'll begin with one very common idea that's built into our common sense, which is that the world, the physical world, consists of two aspects, respectively form and matter. This was foisted on us by Aristotle and also by the Bible because it is said that God created man out of the dust of the earth and as it were made a figurine in his own image and then breathed the breath of life into its nostrils so that this form of clay became a living being. And so underneath that lies the notion that everything material is made of some sort of basic stuff like clay is the basis of pots. And for centuries, scientists, philosophers wanted to know what is that stuff? What are we made of? Now look here, a carpenter makes tables out of wood and a potter makes pots out of clay. But I ask you, is a tree made of wood? Obviously not. A tree is wood. It's not made of it. Is a mountain made of rock? Obviously not. It is rock. See, our language contains innumerable ghosts. Supposing I say the lightning flashes. Surely the flashing is the same as the lightning. There is not one thing called lightning and another called flashing. The lightning is the flashing. It is raining. What is this it that is raining? The raining. I can make a noun out of a verb any time by turning it into a gerund. So we populate the world with ghosts which arise out of the structure of our language and thus therefore of the structure of our thinking because we think in language or in figuring in numbers. And so it's of intensely fascinating investigation to find out what are the hidden assumptions that underlie language and figuring. In other words, language and mathematics. And here is this basic assumption, you see, that is almost with us all. It comes again and again into our everyday speech that form, pattern, organization, organisms are made of something. As if there were some inert, primordial, and of course stupid stuff which had to be put into shape by an energy and an intelligence other than the stuff. Like the intelligence of the potter shapes the clay. 
So therefore, we have a basic picture of the world in which everything is being pushed around. There's a boss. There's somebody in charge who is different from what that somebody is in charge of and puts everything into shape because our common sense does not allow that things shape themselves. Very odd. In Chinese, the word for nature is ziran, which is that which is so of itself, the spontaneous. The Chinese have no difficulty in thinking about nature as self-shaping. A Chinese child would not ask its mother, how was I made? It would ask its mother, how did I grow? Which would be quite different, you see. So to be made is to be commanded. And therefore, every good being obeys. Whether you obey God, or whether you obey the laws of nature, you obey. And the an analog, therefore, of the world that has been put into our common sense is one of military command. Note that. Because the image of God, I would go further and say the idolatrous image of God, which has been handed down to us, is one of the beneficent tyrant, the boss. Big Papa. So then, when our physicists started to find out what stuff was, they went into it and into it and examined it with ever more minute instruments. They first started cutting up things with knives and cutting them smaller and smaller and smaller until the particle that they wanted to dissect was exactly the same width as the edge of the knife. And so they got an atom. And that word in Greek, atomos, means the non-cuttable. A non tomos cuttable. That's the basic atom. What you can't cut anymore, because you got down to the end. Well, they weren't satisfied with that. So they got an atomos, in other words, a particle of something or other that was just the same width as the blade of the, the, edge, the knife edge, and they looked at it under a microscope. And they saw that it was, seemed to be composed of more small particles. So they found out means of working those out, and then they found out extraordinary means of uh, investigating the properties of matter. Then they reached a point where they couldn't decide whether it was particles or whether it was waves. So they called them wavicles. They thought they had come to certain ultimate wavicles called electrons. But then, unfortunately, everything fall, fell apart and they found protons, mesons, and many other uh, extraordinary things. Because, of course, what they didn't realize was that as you make more and more powerful microscopic instruments, the universe has to get smaller and smaller in order to escape the investigation. Just as when the telescopes become more and more powerful, the galaxies have to recede in order to get away from the telescopes. Because what is happening in all these investigations is through us and through our eyes and senses, the universe is looking at itself. And when you try to turn around to see your own head, what happens? See? It runs away. You never get at it. You can't bite your own teeth. You can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. This is the principle. Shankara explains it beautifully in his commentary on the Kena Upanishad, where he says that that which is the knower, the ground of all knowledge, is never itself an object of knowledge, just as fire doesn't burn itself. So there's always that profound mystery that you are never going to be in absolute control of what goes on
Because if you were, it'd be like making love to a plastic woman. And who wants that? There always is the mystery. Uh -uh. The thing we don't know. As Van der Leeuw put it, the mystery of life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. If there were not that, you see, there would be no life. The reason why certain people turn to philosophy, why I became a philosopher, was that since I was a little boy, I always felt that existence as such was weird. I mean, here we are. Isn't that odd? Of course it's odd. What do you mean, what do you mean by odd? Well, that's what's different from even. I mean, what's odd stands out. What's even lies flat. But you can't see the outstanding without the flat background. Is there, you know, here's the thing standing out. It's odd. Each one of you is odd. Strange, unique, particular, different. But how do we know what we mean by that? Except against the background of something even that is not differentiated, like space. And so you get this philosophical itch. You begin to scratch your head and think about why is that so? <sighs> well, after a while, you realize that's a meaningless question. Then you ask, how is it so? Well, that leads you into science and other investigations. So you want to know, what is it? I mean, this, this happening, this thing called existence, what is it? You ask that question long enough and it suddenly hits you that if you could answer it, you wouldn't know what terms to put the answer in. I mean, when we investigate the properties of nature, and we do get some answers, all the answers are in terms of particular structures, forms, patterns. And these can be measured, and their behavior can be predicted. But when I want to ask the question, what are the forms made of? I mean, what is it really? We can't think of any way in which we could answer the question. Because we would have to have a class of all classes. When you ask the question, what? It's like saying, is you is or is you ain't? Is you animal? Is you vegetable? Is you mineral? Are you a Republican or a Democrat? Are you male or female? Are you a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or what have you? We classify always to give an answer to the question, what is it? And when you classify, you distinguish an inside group from an outside group. Right, so what we want to know is what is the group of all groups? Well, we can't imagine what the outside would be. So we can't answer the question. What is it? So the physicists finally abandoned the quest for stuff. And they gave us a description of the universe entirely in terms of form. The pattern, not the stuff. And people ask, what's the web? Yeah, but you can't do that. What's the pattern made of? Surely there mustn't be an answer to that. See, what happens is, when you turn up the microscope, all stuff turns into form. It becomes articulate. You know, the carpet uh, looks like some sort of stuff. But 
when you look at it under a microscope, you will see the crystalline structure of the nylon or whatever it's made of. See? They want to know what are those crystals made of. All right? Turn up the volume and you'll find uh, molecules. Turn up the volume. You find wavicles. But we think the, the, the wavicles must be of something. But of course they're not. We find substance or stuff totally vanishes. And we're left with form. Sanskrit doesn't really have a word for matter. It has namarupa, which means name form. It's the form that matters. Or let's put it in another way, everything is a matter of form. <laughs> now let's go into this, it's fascinating. They say, does it matter? What does that mean? Does it matter? Is it important? In other words, does it measure up to anything? All right, let's go back to the Indo-European roots of the language. Matter comes from a Sanskrit root, matra, which means to measure. To lay out the foundation, say, for a building. So from this root, matra, we get going on into Sanskrit, we get the word maya. And maya is generally translated illusion, although it also means magic, creative power. The word illusion, switch over, we get that from Latin. And that comes from the Latin ludere, to play. Let's pretend that we matter. <laughs> and so, also from the root matra, see, you get meter. That is also to measure. You get mitir in Greek, mater in Latin, which means mama mother the mother of Buddha was called Maya Mary Ma again is the mother of Jesus Ma 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 but Ma you see is a matter of form The Chinese call the basic principle of nature Li and the character for Li means the markings in jade, the fiber in muscle, the grain in wood. So Joseph Needham translates it organic pattern. And that's what's going on. And there isn't any stuff involved. What stuff is, is a pattern seen out of focus, where it becomes fuzzy. Like kapok, see? We say kapok is the stuffing of a cushion. And that's stuff. It's, you know, some kind of goop. But when we examine the kapok closely, we find structure. And th that's what you will find, and there never will be anything else. crazy because it completely flouts our common sense we say but surely when philosophers beat tables that are in front of them and you know they say it is there because bang you know there must be something that is stuff that is substantial but the only reason why you can't pass your hand through a table is the table's moving too fast <laughs> it's like trying to put your finger through an electric fan only it's going much faster than an electric fan anything solid is going so fast that there's no way to get this through it that's all so you say what is it that is going so fast well that question is based on a, a grammatical illusion the grammatical illusion is that all verbs have to have subjects. 
Can you imagine anything more weird than the idea that a verb or an action or event must be set into motion by a noun? That is to say, a non-event or thing. Now, what's the difference between a thing and an event? I can't, for the life of me, tell. We say, this is a fist. That's a noun. What happens to it when I open my hand? This thing has unaccountably disappeared. So I should have called this a fisting. And this is a handing. It may also be a pointing. So we, we, we could devise a language such as that of the Nootka Indians, where there are no nouns, there are only verbs. Chinese is very close to that. I think the superimposition of the idea of noun and verb on the Chinese language is a Western invention. I can't think of any Chinese word for a noun. But the, all those languages of Indo-European uh, origin have nouns and verbs in them. They have agents and operations. And that's one of the basic snags when we divide the world into operations and agents, doers and doings. Then we ask such silly questions as, who knows? Who does it? What does it? When the what that is supposed to do it is the same as the doing. And you can very easily see that the whole process of the universe may be understood as process. Nobody's doing it. Because when you go back to doing it, you go back to the military analogy, the chain of command. The bus who goes bang and the object obeys. It's a very crude idea, very unsophisticated. So, if you can bear it, we have suddenly eliminated a spook. And the spook was called stuff. So we are now more at ease with ourselves in a world of form. Namarupa. Named forms. Boy, we can of course get rid of the names. We can uh, go further and try the experiment of not calling the forms by any names. Just observing the forms, although when we've got rid of the names, we can't even call them forms because that's a name. And there's the, the, the bazaars going on, which uh, Buddhists call tathata. And that means suchness, or thusness. Actually, tathata is tathata. Because when a baby first talks, it says da. fathers flatter themselves that it's saying dada, daddy. It isn't. It's saying da. And so the Upanishads say tatvamasi. You're it. <laughs> the basic da. But da doesn't mean anything. Da is like everything else. See, the world is a musical phenomenon. Good music never refers to anything except the music itself. You don't ask Mr. Bach, Mr. Ravi Shankar, what do you mean by this music? What is it intended to express? Bad music always expresses something other than itself, like the 1812 Overture or the Sunken Cathedral. Good music never talks about anything other than the music. If you ask Bach, what is your meaning? He say, listen, that's the meaning. 
Giraffes are giraffing, trees are treeing, stars are starring, clouds are clouding, rain is raining. And if you don't understand, look at it again. <laughs> and people are people. Wow. We notice that all these suchnesses appear and disappear. They keep changing, they come and they go. But if you get hung up on your particular form, I'll have to alter the language a little bit because you see, your form makes a duality. Whereas you are your form. You're what you're doing. Now you think, mm, for some strange reason I must make that go on as long as possible. And therefore you think you have an instinct to survive. And so the only thing anybody can agree about today, so far as the discussion of ethical and moral problems are concerned, is that we ought to survive. And therefore certain forms of conduct have survival value and certain forms don't. But when you say to yourself, you must go on living, you put yourself in a double bind. Because you said to a process which is essentially spontaneous, that it must happen. And the basic form of the double bind, which is imposed upon all children, is you are required to do that which will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. So when we say to ourselves, you must go on. The reason is, you see, that we are not living in the eternal now, where reality is. We are always thinking that the satisfaction of life will be coming later. There's a good time coming, be it ever so far away. That one far off divine event to which all creation moves. Don't kid yourself. As the Hindus have taught us, in the course of time, everything gets worse. <laughs> it eventually falls apart. <laughs> Comes Kali Yuga, Shiva at the end, and boom. Which is to say, only suckers put hope in the future. You see, I tell you, there are three classes of people in the Western world. The aristocrats, the proletariat, and the bourgeoisie. The aristocrats live on the past because they come of noble family. And they're like potatoes because the best part of them is underground. The proletariat live in the present because they have nothing else and the poor bourgeoisie live for the future they are the eternal suckers they can always open to a con game so when they find out that really uh, th there isn't much of a future you're going to die. They transpose the future into a spiritual dimension. And they figure uh, this material world is not the real world, uh, but the, the spiritual world is the real world. And there will be somewhere, somehow, an eternal life for me. A charge to keep I have a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, fitted for the sky. Well, then they say to them, what are you going to do there? Well, they have the faintest idea. You know that? If you ask theologians about what they think is going to happen in heaven, they just dry up. Oh, you're going to play harps, 
I mean, there's a symbolic meaning to that which I could go into, but the average person's idea of heaven is an absolute bore. I mean, it's like being in church forever. Children see this immediately. Children, when they hear a hymn like, weary of earth and laden with my sin, I looked at heaven and longed to enter in. They think, oh God. <laughs> heaven is to be in church for always. And they think hell is preferable. <laughs> There's at least some excitement going on. And you see it in medieval art. You take, you go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York and you see Jan van Eyck's painting of the Last Judgment. Heaven on top, hell below. In heaven, everybody's looking as that, like the cat that swallowed the canary, sitting in rows and very smug. God the Father is president and, uh, oh dear. Beneath this, there's a winged skull, like a bat and squirming bodies, all nude, <laughs> all being eaten by snakes, and I don't know, it's a fantastic thing going on. But in that, you see, Van Eyck had a ball painting that, because in, in, in medieval way, it was the only way you could get away with painting nudes. <laughs> and sexy scenes, sadomasochistic, see? So that's naturally why hell became much more interesting than heaven. <laughs> so, therefore, this hope for the future is a hoax. It's a perfect hoax. And maybe we, we will make spiritual progress. Everybody puts it off. Maybe if I work at yoga for 10 years, 20 years, and uh, do, do this thing, I will eventually make it to moksha, to nirvana, whatever. That's nothing more than a postponement. It's this business of, because you're not fully alive now, you think maybe someday you will be. Look, supposing I ask you, what did you do yesterday? No, what did I do yesterday? I've, in fact, I've forgotten. So, but most people will say, well, let me see now. Let me get out my notebook. I got up at uh, 7.30 and I brushed my teeth and I read the newspaper over a cup of coffee and then I looked at the clock and dressed and uh, got in the car and drove downtown and did this and that in the office and so on and you go on and on and on and you suddenly discover that what you've described has absolutely nothing to do with what happened. You've described a scraggly, skeletal, fleshless list of abstractions. Whereas if you were actually aware of what went on. You could never describe it. Because nature is multidimensional. Language is linear. Language is scrawny. And therefore, if you identify the world as it is with the way the world is described, it's as if you were trying to eat dollar bills and expect a nutritious diet. Or eat numbers. A lot of people eat numbers. People play the stock market. They're doing nothing but eating numbers. And they're always unhappy. Absolutely miserable. Because they never get anything. So therefore, they always hope more is coming. Because they believe that if they eat enough dollar bills, eventually, something satisfactory will happen. So, eating the abstractions all the time, we want more, more, more time. Confucius very wisely said, a man who understands the Tao in the morning may die with content in the evening. Because when you understand, you don't put your hope in time.
Time won't solve a thing. So when we enter into the, the, the practice of meditation, of yoga, we are doing something radically unlike other human activities. Of course, the way yoga is sold in the United States, like everything else, is that it's supposed to be good for you. It isn't. It has nothing to do with anything that's good for you. It's the one activity which you do for its own sake and not because it's good for you, not because it will lead anywhere, because you cannot go to the place where you are now, obviously. Yoga is to be completely here and now. That's why the word yog means join. Get with it. Be completely here and now. This is the real meaning of concentration, to be in your center. And the Christian word for sinning in Greek is amatanin, which means to miss the point. And the point is eternal life, which is here and now. Come to your senses. <laughs> so yoga is defined in Sanskrit. In the Yoga Sutra, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Difficult to translate, but roughly, yoga is the stopping of... Uh, Vritti is turning, see, like a wheel. And Chitta is consciousness. Turnings in consciousness. In other words, the attempt of the mind to catch hold of itself, which is what we call thinking. Worrying. So we could say loosely, yoga is the cessation of thinking. It's not the cessation of awareness, but of symbolizing, trying to catch, touch reality in terms of thoughts, symbols, descriptions, definitions. Give it up. It's not easy because we do it habitually. But until there is silence of the mind, it is almost impossible to understand eternal life, that is to say, eternal now. If you could come to the place where you suspend conceptions, conceptions in Sanskrit are called vikalpa, so the state is called near vikalpa, not conception. And this it will be basic to everything I'm going to talk to you about. To understand non-verbal reality, non-conceived reality, what I call suchness, tathata. It's really very easy, it's too easy. That's why it's difficult. But that when you are fully aware and not thinking, you will notice some amazing uh, absences. <laughs> there is no past. Can you hear anything past, incidentally? Can you hear anything future? They're just not there to the plain sense of one's ears. Ears are easiest to begin with. Can you hear anyone listening to something else other than sound, you know? Can you hear the listener? No? Well then presumably it's not there. When you become again as a child and simply forget all that you ever were told and contemplate what is, 
all these ghosts go away. That's weird. But they just go. And then you enter into the eternal state. Well, there's no problem. Well, then you go back and you collect your opinions again. You think, well, that won't do. How, how can I be practical and be in that sort of state? Well, I remember in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus said um, a lot of things about this. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet, Suleiman in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, faithless ones? Wow. So, do not worry about tomorrow, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or how shall we clothe ourselves? Oh, the rabble seeks after these things. Sufficient to the day is the worry of it. Nobody ever preaches a sermon on that text. Never. I've heard lots of sermons. And never one on that one. Because people say, look, that's all very well, because Jesus was the boss's son. And, and he knew, you see, that he was really in charge of the universe. And he had nothing to worry about. But we have to be practical. Oh? What do you suppose the gospel was? The good news. Do you know it never got out? <laughs> you too are the boss's son. That was the gospel. If Jesus had lived in India, they wouldn't have put him to death. Because everybody in India knows that we're all God in disguise. So if he had said, I and the Father are one, in India they would have said, hooray! You know? <laughs> Lots of people in India know that perfectly well. But here, uh, 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 that's a no-no. <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? You own the place? You keep your position. You're just a creature, a critter. It's in the family system, it's in everything. Because they have their own way of doing it in India. Uh, because... Um, they have a delayed action on it. When you get to be a certain age and after you've studied long enough with a certain guru, then and then only may you realize this. But until then, uh, 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 it's a still a no-no. But if you've put in the time, they finally let you in. Here you have to wait until you're dead. <laughs> The only place to begin is now. Because here's where we are. So why put it off? A lot of people say, well, I'm not ready. What do you mean you're not ready? What do you, what, what, what do you have to be to be ready? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough because I'm neurotic. I'm uh, perhaps not old enough, not mature enough for such knowledge. I uh, still am frightened of pain. And of course, I'd have to overcome that. I'm still uh, dependent on material things. I have to, you know, eat a lot drink a lot and uh, sex around and all that kind of thing and uh, I, I think that uh, I better get all that under control first oh <laughs> you mean you've got a case of spiritual pride 
You, you, you want to be able to congratulate yourself for having gone through the discipline, which is rewarded with realization. That is trying to quench fire with fire. In other words, the reason, you know, wouldn't it be great to be a mystic? Look at it this way. I mean, crazy. To have no fear, no attachments, no hang-ups. To be as free as the air. So that, uh, you know, you could just wander out in the streets and uh, give away all your clothes to the beggars and uh, let go of the whole thing, let it all hang out. Wouldn't it be crazy to have that courage? And you look into yourself honestly. You find that inside you're actually a quaking mess of sensitivity. <laughs> you know? So that this desire to be the great mystic is nothing more than a symptom of your quaking mess. It's self-defense. So you think, wow, we, we got, we'll do that yoga bit and we'll get real tough. But that only means you're going to be increasingly insensitive. Running away from the quaking mess. Escaping. You never can. You're stuck with it. There's nothing you can actually do to transform your own nature into unattached selflessness. Because you have a selfish reason for wanting to do it. Well, that's pretty depressing, isn't it? You mean to tell me that the only people who get really enlightened and liberated are those whom the grace of God somehow hits in an arbitrary way? And all you can do is sit around and wait? Well, let's begin with that supposition. Let's suppose there's nothing we can do to change ourselves. You know, psychotherapy, religion, all this is absolutely in vain. There's nothing, nothing, nothing you can do about it. It's like trying, as I said, to bite your own teeth or lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. Incidentally, it struck me as funny, a lot of people are using that phrase in the wrong way. They say when uh, something very difficult has to be done, we have to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. You can't! It's impossible. So that's terribly de depressing. You mean Alan Watts, you'll come here simply to tell us that there's nothing we can do. I mean, here uh, we are all presumably assembled in a cultural uh, milieu, spiritual milieu, psychotherapeutic milieu, where we are supposed to get better. And I tell you, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, I said, give us our money back. <laughs> Go to somebody else who'll be more encouraging. <laughs> but... What does it mean that you can't do anything about it? Singing loud and clear. The reason you can't do anything about it is that you don't exist. That is, as an ego, as a soul, a separate will, just isn't there. Well, when you understand that, you're liberated. <laughs> they say in Zen, you cannot take hold of it, nor can you get rid of it. In not being able to get it, you get it. When you are silent, it speaks. When you speak, it is silent. Now, don't misunderstand me. This is not any kind of fatalism. When I say, you as you conceive yourself to be, that is your ego, your image of yourself, isn't there. It doesn't exist. It's an abstraction. It's like three. Did you ever see three? It's plain, ordinary, three? No, nobody ever saw it. 
thoughts. It's a concept. It's a vikalpa. So in the same way as oneself. There's the happening, the suchness. Yes, sure, you, you bet. But it's not pushing you around because there's no you to be pushed around. In other words, there's no billiard ball on the end of the queue. There's the queue. No, it, it goes this way and goes that way. Where they call a Buddha a Tathagata. One who comes or goes thus. This way and that way. See? He went that way. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, this illusion of the persecuted ego who is pushed around by fate is it just altogether disappeared. And so, in likewise, the illusion of the ego who pushes fate around has also disappeared. There's a happening. So, in this, do you see what has happened? by dying to yourself, by having become completely incompetent and found that you don't exist, you're reborn. You become everything. In the words of Sir Edwin Arnold, foregoing self, the universe grows I. <laughs>